Fuji Sports. Listen, they've been working with us for a while now. Um, particularly, they've been supporting and sponsoring this show for over a year. And uh, they have some cool stuff going on, on their website, don't they? They always have cool stuff. Uh, amazing gear. Anything you would need for your jiu-jitsu journey, you can find at fujisports.com. But just scrolling through right now, uh, apparel, obviously, geese, bags, anything you could possibly ask for, you can find at fujisports.com. Hey, it's been a while since we started Roll TV Project. Uh, it's been a while since you started it. I did come in later, and um, I can't say enough about it, especially the new platform. It's really amazing, fully customizable, uh, and you know a little bit more about the structure. Well, so two things you need to know. One is the subscription service, which is 9 bucks a month. Um, you can get access to hundreds of videos, hundreds of drills, techniques, and so on in a very nice labor, library categorized as you need them. But two different lessons. Um, you can actually purchase those individually and you own them so the subscription is not tied to it at all. You can look at things like spider guard, half guard sweeps, half guard chokes, um, uh, folding pass, and so on. There's so many of them out there. So take a look um, and see where you need help with the videos, right? 30% if you type in Roll Radio as a code, who doesn't like saving money, go to RollAcademy.tv. What's up, everyone, and welcome back. If you haven't already, please remember to hit the like, share, subscribe, download, listen, and whatever other button there is, and leave us a review wherever you do listen. That ensures that we can continue bringing you the great guests and amazing content that you have come to expect. This week's guest is a newly promoted black belt under Essential Jiu-Jitsu's legendary JT Torres, Marcus Johnson. Marcus sits down with us to discuss his 13-year journey from a high school wrestler with a 0-30 and record to becoming the high-level black belt that he is today. He details how his early struggles framed his mindset, how external factors affected his training, what it takes to become a high-level jiu-jitsu practitioner, what is necessary to be a successful academy owner, and how he returned to jiu-jitsu after long breaks from training. Here's the Roll Radio with a young man who was trained with the best in the world, to Tommy to go founder, coach and GM at Essential BJJ and new BJJ black belt, Marcus Johnson. Welcome to Raw Radio. Hey, we are live. Gary, happy Monday. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a good one so far. I'm pretty yeah. happy. I'm glad to be back. I was sick like a dog last week. Jeez. Yeah, Lord. it takes a lot for you to, to not show up, and it's always allergies, but I think this time uh, it was real. <laughs> Dude, I was, I was out. I yeah. was done. I was done. I taught the class on Monday, and then Tuesday I was... I was out of commission. I was. It yeah. was over. It was a nice. It was quiet around here for once. It yeah, was, everything went smoothly. <laughs> <laughs> Great. But I was also are out you, for a couple of, uh, a couple you, scheduled days. So I don't you, know. Are you telling yeah. me I'm useless around here? No, it's just everything gets more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I don't know if that's a compliment Tess, or insult. It, but. No, it's it's wonderful. Either way, it's it's wonderful. Don't yeah, worry about it. You, hey, uh, real quick before what? we get to the guest, uh, you got more exciting news, and I think uh, I think we should mention it really what is quick. It? You know what it is. No, you want me to say it? Yeah. Uh, I think I feel like you. you no. Well, I'll, I'll do it. Go yeah. for uh, it. Well, you Go got another it. instructional out with BJJ fanatics, and I feel like yeah, this I one is up. is um, like you made it just for me. This, it was. This one, was it? it was. I appreciate. The Actually, I'm, I'm anticipating only one sale. Yeah. It will be you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I need it because, uh, and I, let me make sure I get this exactly correct because it just came out this weekend. Yeah. And it's uh, escapes engineered for guys over forty. Yeah. And I fit into that category. Uh, yeah. Because it should one, be over seventy for you. Well, part. yes, I am well over forty, and also <laughs> um, I need help with all my escapes. So uh, I appreciate it. But go to bjjfanatics.com. Check it out. Uh, is there anything more you want to add? It, you know, we you know after a conversation with guys at BJJ Fantasy, we designed this special curriculum purely for guys. You know, and, and, and you know who 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 are older, who, who are up there, and it's not necessarily limited to guys over forty, but that's how we title it. Um, but it's very mechanical, not a lot of pushing, not a lot of bench pressing, not a lot of tossing. Um, it, it's just finding small spaces is really finding some of these escapes from a compromised position. So if, if you struggle with that, go, go take a look. It's, yeah, it's been a pleasure working with the guys as always. So yeah, even if you don't struggle with it, I think you're going to find a lot of great new tips and, and, uh, concepts. So definitely check it out. All, All right. right. That, that's enough of the, 
shameless plugging. <laughs> well, let's get to it. Marcus, great to see you. Thanks Good for joining us. Welcome, welcome, welcome to, to the Row Radio. Um, pleasure, pleasure being here. But first, before we start anything, first of all, congratulations on your black belt. And this is very fresh, right? This is like literally two weeks old, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, so I was awarded my black belt 16 days ago, March 12th. Congratulations. There you go. Wow. There you go. Did it sink in yet? Did, did it... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's, it's sunk in. <laughs> <laughs> the first day, first couple of days was really not like even when like I, I was like sitting on the mat and like I definitely sat on the mat by myself in the corner and cried for a second. I was like looking down and I was like, why is the bar on my belt? <laughs> The black belt wasn't the weird part. It was the red bar. I was like, this is so awesome. It's, it does stand out, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it is such a unique experience, I think, um, being rewarded black belt. Wherever you train, whoever you are, however long it took, whatever effort it took. But it, that, that moment that we all kind of aim for, not kind of, we all aim for that. We, there, there is a desire for everybody to achieve that level. Um, and be having that honor and having that that privilege to be rewarded by by their own professor. What what did that feel like for you? What what was that moment when that happened? When your name got called out? And I did actually saw the the, the video yeah, it of it's GT calling great. out your name and the crowd going completely crazy. What what what, yeah. what went through your mind? Um, it was very surreal for me. Uh, so I was a brown belt for quite some time. Um, a little background on myself. Uh, and I've been training for roughly 13 years. Um, I started when I was 16 years old. I'm 28, turning 29 now. I took some time off in between here and there uh, for a variety of different reasons. Um, but it was very surreal to me because I actually, prior to training and working here at JT's gym in White Plains, New York, Essential Jiu-Jitsu, I worked and trained at the Marcelo Garcia Academy in New York City. Um, and I was there for three or four years, working every day and training every day with like all the really, really high level guys there. It was a really great experience for me. Um, and I got four stripes on my brown belt there. And then COVID happened. So <laughs> they definitely, and I talked about this when I, when I, when I got my black belt, when I gave like my little like blurb of a speech, I was like, yeah, definitely at one point I was like, oh, well, here we go. Never gonna get my black belt. What's going to end? It is what it is. You know, sucks to suck, I guess. Um, so it was very surreal. Um, then I got my black belt and I remember leading up to this promotion ceremony, which I knew was going to be a promotion ceremony. I was, um, how can I say, I, I put in my mind that I might be getting promoted, right? Because I've been a, a brown belt for almost five years, but if I didn't get promoted, it, it wouldn't bother me. Right. I, I was very, very, I feel very strongly about my understanding of jujitsu and my technique and if I didn't get promoted, I just felt, you know, this is just me getting another opportunity to fight the major tournaments again at Brown Belt, right? Like, whether I have a black or brown belt around my waist, I don't think it really changes the knowledge or the skills which I have, but it's just more of um, my ability and my opportunities to fight uh, at the lower belts uh, and maybe get a, get a major title. Um, receiving the black belt was a great feeling. Um, I definitely was very, very overwhelmed at the time. Very overwhelmed. Like looking back, I, I have no idea. I had to watch it so many times. I have no idea what I said after. <laughs> I was just completely overwhelmed. As you guys saw in the video, there was a lot of people here. So we had at the Academy, we had our grand opening ceremony, even though we had been open for a couple months already yeah. due to COVID, we pushed off our big grand opening ceremony. We had a seminar with Andre Gonval, yep. Michael Lear Jr., Angelica Gonval, and uh, Professor JT himself. Right, so all these people were here. There's tons of visitors here. Um, a couple of my teammates also received their black belts, and they were, for the most part, uh, older guys, right? more professional guys who some have kids. Uh, two of them are police officers. So I was definitely the only one who was like younger and like kind of a, a full-time jiu-jitsu athlete who received his black belt at the promotions. So it was very, very uh, shocking and impressive and like surreal to me at that moment. Um, I was stunned, and I, I was overwhelmed with a sense of gratitude and and just kind of like uh, completion, you know, like, like I not completion in that it's done, but now I, I feel that everything that I had been working for was a little more legitimacized, whatever the word would be. Legit, <laughs> yeah. legit, got I can't it. Make it more legit. No, yeah, yeah, would, yeah, for yeah. sure. And we'll mm -hmm. definitely get back to your history in a moment because I do want to know mm -hmm. how you, how all started. I want to know how these dynamics and, but, but let's talk about this black belt for a second. 
many、mm-hmm. consider this black belt as a as a beginning, as a true、mm-hmm. beginning. Is, is that what is in your mind at this point, or is it a sense of accomplishment and a milestone and a kind of you know an ending of of a chapter, if you will? How are you looking at this right now, as it's all fresh?、Mm. Yeah, this is a great question actually, because this is a dynamic that we hear many people speak about all the time.、Mm-hmm. Um, so the way I look at it personally is it is both, right? It is the ending of a chapter, ending of the color belts, and the beginning of a new chapter.、Um, in my mind,、uh, I always looked at competitive jujitsu in a very unique light, in that the only victories that mattered were the victories you had at the brown belt level and the black belt level, because At the black belt level, when you win, you are the best of the best. And at the brown belt level, you're the best of the rest. And in the modern day, with the internet age and people taking jujitsu more seriously as a career and the exchange of information, right? Some really good blue and purple belts are just as good as many black belts. Oh yeah,、right? absolutely. But these days, like the lines are very skewed, right? We see these kids who have been training since they were literally in diapers. Green belts beating up black belts, blue belts beating up black belts, and not to say that the black belt is not of a high level, right? So these days is very, very、uh, unique compared to kind of like five, ten years ago. I feel.、Um, so I definitely look at it as a sense of accomplishment and achievement, but also like now is what matters. Now is is the time that when I fight, these are the things that matter. Like my career, like it's like I'm no longer an amateur, in a way. Although I've been doing jujitsu. As my profession and my career for a couple of years now, now I'm I'm a professional when I go and fight for real because I'm fighting the best of the best, right? I can sign up for a tournament and fight guys who have won the world championships at the black belt level, so on and so. Do you think? Do you so? Do you think that in the lower belts, particularly like let's say, let's just say purple, which is not a brown, is right below, right? Do you think that those competitors shouldn't take it as seriously? And I don't mean in a disrespectful way. I mean that there is a there is a lo- room for、um, error, if you will. There is room for leniency. There is a leniency. It's it's not the brown belt yet, so I can not put that much pressure on myself. I believe that、uh, as competitors, people should put less pressures on themselves overall, especially at the lower belts.、Um, well, I do understand, and and let me just preface this by saying I've never won a major tournament、uh, in IBJF, so、uh, I also don't mean to disrespect or say anything which offends anyone, right?、Uh, especially with my last comment about saying like the other colored belts don't matter. That's not true, right? A world champion at a blue belt level is still very impressive. You、mm-hmm. still had many matches, and and guys trained very hard to get that. So I'm not trying to take from that accomplishment by any means. And this is just how I framed it in my mind. Yeah. But I think that as as a whole, competitors should put less pressure on themselves, especially in the color belts. Right. While we always want to win when we compete,、um, I think the the overall goal should be to get better. Right. And if you put so much pressure on yourself, for instance, and you put this goal in your mind, like I want to be a world champion at the twenty. 23 purple belt lightweight division, and you don't get that goal. Some people may take that and use it as motivation to get better, and some people may be dissuaded and be like, "Oh, I feel like I fail." Right. So,、um, me personally, I never really like verbalized or wrote down on a board like my goal is to become a world champ. Right. While I fought the worlds, and when I was fighting the worlds, my goal was definitely to win. That wasn't like the big overarching goal because I didn't want to put something out there that I was maybe if I didn't get it, I feel like I failed. My goal has always been to become as good as I possibly can at jujitsu, to be at the highest level, and be equally respected as an athlete, as an instructor, and as a coach. Because I firmly believe that these three things are all very different.、Mm-hmm. And over the course of my years training with many high-level、uh, individuals, I have experienced people who excel at one of them and not the other two, or two of them and not the other one. And this has always been very important for me.、Um, so. That, that's how I feel about about those. I get I get to tell you, there's a very mature way of looking at it. I wish more people looked at it that way. I feel like, you know, after 20 plus years in the mat and 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 seeing students compete and even talking about competition, there's this sometimes even unreasonable expectation of success. And 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 I don't mean to take away from anybody. And I, we should be desired. We should desire of success. We should. Desire to achieve our goals, but I feel like often we 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 want, you know, I want to be a world champion, but I can only show up twice a week, and is that really reasonable? 
Like, it, what are your thoughts on this as we are on this topic, kind of picking your brain on this? Yeah, 100%, I agree with you, right? Everyone, right, when it comes down to it, in some way or another, if they had the option to be a world champion, they would, right? That's mm -hmm. like one of the coolest things you could say. Yeah. Who doesn't want to say they're the best at something in the world? Like, that's, that's like amazing, right? Like, that's so unique. How many people are in the world? Like, 7 billion? I don't know exactly. Um, but yeah, you have to be reasonable. Right. And realistically, I think what it boils down to is at the end of the day, you can only be the best at the world at being yourself. And for some people, being a black belt world champion at the adult level is not in the cards. But this doesn't make them any worse of a person or any worse at jujitsu. And I think sometimes when we get brainwashed, right, by seeing these guys who won the colored belt world championships every year and they get a new belt every year and they go and they smoke the division, right, it puts an unreasonable expectation. And imagine kids growing up playing basketball against LeBron James. They're like, how am I ever going to beat that guy? And I think this is a similar, similar dynamic, especially now with Instagram mm -hmm. and right. BJ fanatics is a great tool. There's right? a saturation I, I of information. Know. Yeah. Instructionals. But with the information age, like it's so easy for us to compare to someone else. Right. And I even got caught up doing this myself. Right. I have many, many peers, all my peers who I trained with that, at Marcelo's back in the day, they all received black belts before me. Like the guys who were my brown belt crew and like my grad, my hypothetical graduating class. Mm -hmm. Like some of my favorite training partners from back in the day who many I still can consider some of my best friends and, and like brothers to me. Right? They all received black belts before me and they would always ask, oh, when are you going to get your black belt? Oh, when are you going to get your black belt? And it didn't really bother me so much that I didn't have it, but it would have been nice to be like, okay, like, please stop asking me. Right. Because I, I found myself comparing because of their, their question, when are you going to get back? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know when I'm going to get my black belt. Does this mean I'm less than you guys? And the answer was no. But it, it, it sometimes can feel that way when you put these pressures on yourself or society puts this pressure on yourself. Um, and I think particularly in, in American society, this is very common. And this goes beyond jujitsu, right? We always like to kind of one up other people or compare ourselves, especially, you know, kids these days are getting upset because they don't get enough likes on Instagram. Mm -hmm. and I'm just as addicted to my phone and social media as anyone else. So don't, don't let me act like I'm on some high horse, but if you're conscious of it, I think it makes it a little better. Mm -hmm. But it, I, also, I think what's important here is what I, what you're talking about is, you know, you, you, you talked about, you know, your peers getting promoted as a, from a Brown to black and, and you were kind of, uh, well, left it behind is, is maybe not the term here, but you you were the one, and a lot of everybody's asking you. That's slightly different situation when you are blue belt. It's slightly mm -hmm. different situation when you are white belt, right? I mean, after ten years or six years on the mat and seeing people getting promoted, you we develop this sense of maturity, if you will. Okay, it'll come in my time. We kind of accept our journey. We accept our path. And instructors often talk about it, at least the good ones, right? But when you're in the very beginning, you're six months in, a year in, a year and a half in, you got these four damn stripe on that white belt and you're grinding it. And there is a guy who started after you and he's passing by and he just got his blue belt in front of him. And you're like, God, what? I'm going to quit because why would I? He's better than me and everything I put. Am I wrong? I agree with you. It's a very, it seems very disheartening. And then I think that is another reason why statistically most people don't make it past blue belt. Yep. Because blue belt, you know, I, I, I genuinely believe that at a blue belt level, for the most part, if you're in a real street altercation, you will do okay. Mm -hmm. Right. And then to get past blue belt, you have to really put in the time to like learn how to do jujitsu against people who really know jujitsu. Mm -hmm. Even like a high level or not high level, but a higher degree white belt is pretty dangerous compared to the common folk. Oh, absolutely. So once you get to blue belt, you have enough training now where the people, the other blue belts, like they really know what they're doing too. And you have to really start to apply critical thinking, mm -hmm. problem solving, so on and so forth. And yeah, I definitely think that it can be very disheartening. Um, but I just remember, uh, I remember watching like short docu series back in, when I was coming up through the belt ranks, um, and I believe Luke Stewart produced most of them. Mm -hmm. um, and one of them, I believe, was about Cobrinha, uh, Rubens Charles Cobrinha, mm -hmm. right? And then one of them was about uh, Felipe Costa. Oh. And I remember the the story about Felipe Costa was he never ever won a world championship at a color belt, but then he won it at black. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that stuck out to me a lot. 
And even, you know, now I remember even before, like just right before I got promoted, I was, I was saying to one of my training partners, you know, like, uh, oh, I don't think I want to get promoted because I never want to major. And this is, and this, cause some of my, my peers had won majors and this was the wrong way to think. And I'm happy that eventually I let that kind of uh, angst go. Right. And I, I don't remember the exact situations that Kobe was talking about in this interview, but I remember him talking about, uh, taking some losses. Right, like taking some losses in his career. And he's one of, one of the greatest featherweights of all time. Mm-hmm. Right? And I just remember him saying, and I think you said this as well, like, you know, like, oh, my time will come. I remember him saying in this, in this short interview or documentary, like, oh, my time will come. Oh, my time will come. And this was a guy who, who for those who don't know that much about Cobrinha, he started jujitsu pretty late relative to most other people. I believe he started around 19 or 21. Yeah, right? he so he a, started even yeah, later than I did. Yeah, he was in his 20s, I think, yeah. Yeah, he was in his 20s and and he ended up becoming like one of the, the all time greats. And now, look, his yeah. son is doing very, very, very well. Yeah. You know, so I always try to keep these things in my mind when I have, would have these like creeping uh, feelings of like anxiety or feeling a little less than so on and so forth. Yeah, it's hard. Gary, you, I saw well, you wanted to say something. I just think that, you know, the uh, I was going to ask earlier, and I think you just summed it up, though, is is how did you approach it to get those negative thoughts out of your head? Because those once those get in there, man, they're really, really hard to get out. We just had a promotion ceremony here a few weeks ago where there was guys who started a year after me who passed, who was, you know, gotten uh, higher ranks now. And I'm not going to lie, the, the days leading up to knowing that was going to happen, I was like, I was pretty down on myself. But then the day arrived and just being there to celebrate with them kind of overrode all of that. And it put things in perspective for me. And I don't know how you got out of your own headspace, you know, because I think it comes with with maturity. I've got I'm almost twice your age where I don't know if a young guy in their 20s is mature enough to to think through all that. Yeah, I, I definitely think some of it comes with maturity. Also, I've taken a significant amount of losses uh, in my life. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I don't want to talk too much about my history right now, but I wrestled in high school for four years varsity and the first oh. three of them, I was zero and 30. Wow. Oh okay. boy. The okay. last one I ended up, I think like 15 and 17 or 17 and 15, something like this. Right. Um, so I've taken a lot of losses in my life and seen people succeed when I failed many times over. So I always kept in the back of my mind, like no matter what happens, you're going to keep trucking along. You're going to be okay. Just stay and trust the process. And this is something Professor JT says all the time is uh, one hard work works and to trust the process. So I think all of this really plays back into my overall mindset about like getting my black hole also was like the goal wasn't to become, you know, X, Y, and Z champion and X, Y, and Z belt. And when this tournament and that tournament, and then this, my goal is to get as good as I possibly can. My goal is always to be an elite level black belt, get my black belt from someone who was very, very well respected so that my black belt was highly recognized uh, and then to be equally respected as a high level uh, athlete, instructor and coach. Yeah. Wonderful. It, it's just, I wanted to ask you a question. It literally slipped out of my mind. <laughs> Lord. Lord. Well, well let's talk want? about getting your black belt from somebody like JT. And I, you know, you mm-hmm. just touched on it. Uh, it seems to mean more to you Um you know, and, and if you look at your history and who you've trained with and who's promoted you over the years, I mean, these are there's we have often talk about levels of jujitsu and the mm-hmm. people that that you've been um, promoted by are at that top level. There's no denying it. There's no you know, when I the first few times I saw JT go with people, I was like, holy shit, like that. It, it opened my eyes to a whole new world of of jujitsu. So being coming up under them. Uh, I'm wondering, do you feel that it is more prestigious, that your black belt means maybe more um, than it would have if you if you came out of, a you know, just a lesser known school with, you know, guys who are still legit, but not mm-hmm. as well known? Yeah, 100 percent. So let me preface this by saying I wasn't always training at these very high level gyms. Okay. I started at a relatively small gym in Monmouth County, New Jersey, training with a guy named Jason Scully. Uh, mm-hmm really great guy. He actually owns the grapplers guide website, yeah. which is a really great website. Shameless plug as well. I have a spider guard instructional on there. So you can check that out. <laughs> plug it in. Well, yes. <laughs> plug it in. Right. Um, and so he, his highest accomplishment competitively, I think he got third at Abu Dhabi trials at one point and like third at Brown Belt Pan Am. So he competed and he did relatively well, but obviously, right. Like it wasn't, he was running a school, right. He didn't have a real high level coach. He didn't come from a big team. Right. 
So he didn't necessarily have all the resources available to me that I have had, right? So I'm not going to say like, oh, he didn't do anything, right? He, he was a great guy. And, you know, he played a very big part in my jujitsu career. Um, then I went to college and I trained under some some guys, uh, the, the Lennon brothers. Not many people know them, about them, but uh, it's Zachary, uh, Zach Lennon, Ezra Lennon, and Levi Lennon. Um, they're in the middle of Missouri. And as you guys probably know, when you get off the two coasts of the country, the level of jujitsu, unfortunately, slowly starts to plummet. And it's no one's fault besides the fact that Brazilians like the beach. Yeah. So when the high level Brazilians come to the, come to the U.S., normally they go where the beach is, right? That's just how it went, right? But they were good. And uh, Zach Lennon took an interest in me because he saw I was like a young 18, 19 year old blue belt. And I didn't really have anything else going for me. So this is the guy who was like, hey, you could like do well with this if you applied yourself and kind of took me under his wing and got me into competing and stuff like this. Right. So I did that trained with them. Ezra actually has been to Abu Dhabi a couple of times. He actually has a win over Pablo Popovich, not at Abu Dhabi, but at a separate tournament, um, which is very, very impressive. You know, uh, he had a very, very tight match with Dean Lister uh, where he was winning like 80% of the match and then got caught in the heel towards the end. Right. Uh, shout out to the Lennon Bros. They're really good. They're in Columbia, Missouri. Check them out at Kabbalah Jiu Jitsu. Um, and then I came back to the East Coast after I wouldn't say failing out of college, but trying to do college. And I was very disillusioned with both myself and what I wanted in life. And I like kind of had to like a moment of clarity when I was like, what do I want to do with my life? And I was like, oh, well, the only thing that really made me happy that people didn't tell me was going to make me happy was jujitsu. So I decided. I want to do jujitsu. And if I'm going to do jujitsu, I want to do the best jujitsu. I don't want to end up just, you know, or, and once again, I, I don't want to be disrespectful when I say this because it can come off pretty harsh, but if you're going to get a degree, you want a degree from your local community college, or you want a degree from Harvard. If you have the option and the means, you're going to pick Harvard. So this is how I looked at it. If I'm going to get a black bone jujitsu and I want to do jujitsu full time, I want to treat this as a career. I want to acquire the highest level knowledge possible. So then I sought out training at Marcel Garcia's Academy. And then the pandemic hit, a bunch of things and aspects of my life changed. And I moved up into the middle of the nowhere in the mountains at one point. And then I found a home here at Essential Jiu Jitsu with uh, Professor JT, who I've known for almost 10 years. I met him in person as a blue belt. That's a great story. How is, so l- l- let me pivot off of that. How, how is changing? these training environments benefiting one, you know, over, over, over a period of time I've been on the mat there, I've noticed two train of thoughts. You stick with one camp. They know you, they will push you to limits. They will benefit you the best they can. They might not have the highest resources or the highest skills, but they know you the best that they can. And the second one is you strategically pick who can take you to the next level? And coincidentally, I mean, we've talked about this, being coach, being good instructor many times on this show from everybody, from world champions and Olympic medalists. Not every coach has a capability of taking a student from grade one to grade eight or from white to black. There are stages, different skills are involved in all of this. But there's these two trains of thoughts. One, you stick on one camp forever, and the other one is you change the camp strategically or based how your life circumstances unfold, but you pick them strategically to benefit you the most. Now, you've had the opportunity to be involved in different academies at different parts of the world on the different levels of yourself, right? So beginning, ending, higher skill sets, and so on. How do you think these changes have benefited you? Do you see that beneficial or you simply didn't have a choice? Do you think you would have done better by being in one place or these changes introduced forced you to, to become much better yourself? Yeah, this is also a really, really great question, by the way, Um, because I, I definitely know what I'm going to, how I'm going to answer, but I've never thought that I'd have to answer this question. So I believe the majority of the changes which occurred within my training were out of uh, external factors, 
So the first one, me switching and training with the Lennon brothers was because I was going away to college. The next one was I moved back to the East Coast and I wanted to put myself in the, in the best position possible. So more like I, I direct, deliberately chose that. And the last one was, uh, for lack of better terms, a uh, result of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe that if your goal is to pursue jujitsu in a way that you want to become the best, right? You have to treat it like someone who's studying to become a doctor, right? The doctor studies at a higher level of education for roughly eight to 12 years, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. And the average time to get a black belt is also eight to 12 years, mm-hmm. right? You're, you're putting in roughly the same amount of effort if you're really, really pursuing it, right? If you're showing up to training every day and then you're doing extra drilling, so on and so forth. And I would say, I lean more towards you have to go with what fits you at the time in the stage of your life you're in, right? So I learned so much about how to train, how to be a professional, how to drill, right? From my time being at the Marcelo Garcia Academy and watching all the high-level guys there, right? While I was there, I would, I would say that it was like the golden era of the gym. Gianni Grippo was there, Marco Sinoco, Mateus Denise, uh, Vinicius Estractor, Atos Miranda, Mateus Lutis. And Marcelo himself, obviously, also John Satava. So I watched all these really, really high-level guys and how they went about their day. How did they approach training? How did they approach drilling? How did they approach teaching students? How did they approach requiring private lessons, so on and so forth? And I took those skills, right, that I would observe from them. Um, one last person I should mention is Paul Schreiner. Mm-hmm. Uh, played a huge part in my understanding of how to communicate with students and other people about the elements of jujitsu. And I learned all these things by watching and observing them and working with them. And also them just beating me up every day, you know, <laughs> uh, that's the best part. And I, I feel like I, I kind of like took a little piece of each of them and how they went about it and applied it now that I'm in a different situation where I'm one of the more senior guys on the mat in regards to experience and years on the mat and training. Um, I don't have anything against the people who say you should stay in one place. If you feel that you can grow in one place, that is great. And maybe that one place is somewhere really high level, right? And for those people, that is enough. Um, But I will say this. If you are going to the gym and you are paying someone to go to that gym, you do not owe them anything at all. You're buying a product. Right. If I go to Burger King and I buy a hamburger and then the next day I just say, I'm going to go to five guys. Burger King's not going to be mad. Oh, they will be pissed. (laughs) But in the jiu-jitsu world, this is sometimes a little different. Right. Well, and I'm I'm really glad you say this. And and I didn't didn't even know that we're going to bridge into that. But I'm really glad you say this because there is this, you know, controversial almost like it creates burns relationships with, with these situations where, you know, I'm moving across the country and you are pissed with me because I'm not staying and training with you. And it is extreme, but I've seen it in person. I've, I've witnessed these things as they are happening, you know, and I'm not even talking about like, hey, can I go and cross train, you know, down to mm-hmm. the other side of the city, you know. And so it is a very unique situation that we find ourselves in jiu-jitsu where, one, this maturity level all, all around, this evolution of jiu-jitsu continues growing. And jiu-jitsu, one, becomes a more professional product that mm. is being sold to the way how jiu-jitsu is being presented to clients and students is by far more accessible. We have video, we have you know classes in person, and we have different locations and so on, right? But at the same time, there, it, there's the other side of all of this is where you know students do have a choice of changing facilities. They do have a choice of changing programs. They do have a choice of changing a coach because for whatever reason it is, and it sucks when these relationships get um, impacted. And I'm sure you see that considering being in, in a general manager role at, at Essential, right? And, and in, at, at um, Marcelo's, you were, you were working there as well. So how, how, you, how do you see that from, from that perspective, from a student perspective and then from the operational perspective at the academy? 
Okay. So from an operations perspective, I look at it this way, uh, just like the same Burger King analogy, right? I look at it this way. If you throw a big stink when someone leaves, right, and you burn that bridge with them as an instructor or as a coach, right, mm -hmm. when that person thinks back about all the years they spent at your gym, they're, it's going to be tarnished because they're going to nice. think about the fact that yep. you're upset and they don't like it, right? And then you're, you're, they're going to feel uncomfortable, and maybe when they come back in the area, they're not even going to want to come visit you. And even worse than that, when someone says, hey, I'm going here. Yep. Where should I train? They're not going to list you. Yep. I'm laughing like, because this is all true. Yeah. What we should be doing is like, you're leaving. I'm happy for you. If you find somewhere that you fit in better, I'm happy for you. Yep. Please come back at any time. We would love to have you come visit and cross train. Yep. Right? This is the approach we should have. And I do think now um, with things changing, I feel like this is getting a little bit better. I feel like the modern day, this is changing a little bit. And the whole like creanche thing is kind of, kind of dying out. You know, I personally, I'm a pretty good example of this, right? I used to work and train at Marcellus. Now I work and train at JT's. You know, we're only about an hour away. Marcellus in the city. I'm up in Westchester, mm -hmm. like, right? I'm just a bit north. But I still have a really great relationship with all of them over. In fact, like I'm going to visit them later this, this week, right? Because you, you just go about it in a mature way, right? I tell them, you know, I appreciate all the training I had here. I appreciate the job I had here, so on and so forth. But I need something to change in my life. Right. It's more so, it was less about the jujitsu. It's more about my life. Like, I didn't want to live in New York City anymore. Right. I'm, I'm Asian American. Hate crimes against Asian Americans in New York City is up like 400% or something. Like, literally, you can look up these statistics. It's crazy. I don't want to live in the city anymore. I bought a new car in the pandemic. Where am I going to park it? Right. I wanted a change in my life. And because of that, I found another job. And I was blessed that I knew JT for 10 years. I was blessed that they, there was a work opportunity for me here. And I managed to work hard enough to get into the, the position here and the situation I'm in. But I don't think we, we should ever like bar people from going and seeing what else is out there. The only reason you would bar someone from going out and seeing what else is out there is if you're insecure about the product and the quality of service you're delivering. And I was even in a situation, I'm not going to say with which gym, right? But prior to me going to train and work in the city, the gym I was, the local gym I was working at back, you know, some of the members and some of the owners were like, oh, they're leaving us to go train in the city? Like, how could you do such a thing? I thought we were building something here, so on and so forth, which was absurd to me because I'm not an owner of the gym. You're the business owner. This is your business. And I pay you. And I'm going to seek higher education to seek a higher level of training, which then in turn, if and when I come back, because I was only going twice a week, cre increases the value in your academy, in your business, right? I'm bringing back like these gems of knowledge and the experience I'm gaining and sharing it with all those around me. So I just find that, that to be a little absurd um, throughout. And it's a very common thing. And it's funny that you, we were talking about this because I see it all the time, yeah. right? People feeling nervous to go train another gym. Like, oh, uh, uh, don't put me in the picture. Like, don't put me in the group picture after training. I don't want my head, that here. My head coaching. <laughs> I've heard it. You have no yep. idea how many times. It's ridiculous. Uh, I, at this point, I always ask, would you like to be in a picture or, or, or should we not? Like, it's just that that's what it boils down to. But but listen, but there, is, but there is one more factor that I think that we are ignoring in this conversation, and that's factor of what is the function of the instructor? What is the function of the coach? What is the function of the teacher? The function of any of those three is to make a student better. And if so, that means that that student needs to go somewhere else and train somewhere else, jujitsu or not jujitsu, it doesn't matter. Then we should be encouraging those students to take the steps necessary for them to take their skill to the next level. At any circumstance, we shouldn't be forbidding them or stopping them from that. I mean, I just find that ridiculous. And it's hard. You might not, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but I have. It's very difficult when you invest a lot of time into a student and it's, you create relationships. I think that is what is hard. You create friendships, relationships, and they leave for whatever reason it is. It is very hard to let it go. It is hard. It's emotional attachment. But I think... It is, it is irresponsible for us 
to say, you can't go over there. What are you doing? They're our competition. You take, like, that. I, I, I get worked up about this. I, I want to I stop talking about this. This is ridiculous. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> you are all fired up on this. I am, because it's ridiculous. Uh, and, what, and by the way, I've I, my journey was very similar to yours. I, I've changed academies multiple times. And it's not because I wanted to. And it's not because it, it, the life circumstances took me in a different directions. I have to move. I had to start a family. I bought a house and so on. And, and, and so it happened. It is, it is what it is. And it is unfortunate. It is unfortunate that some of the people from the past, they don't talk to me. It is what it is. But it's a different life, I guess. I don't know. I'm done. I'm done. This is it. <laughs> well, I we just lost all the listeners. No, I, you know, it was. <laughs> we talked to Steve Cohn, who was a judo uh, Olympic judo coach, yep. and I, most of what he said, you know, is, is what Thomas is bringing up, is that at some point I can only do so much for you, and if you need something else, well, then you got to go seek it out. And and as an, a coach or an instructor or an owner, even I think you should be willing to say to that person, you know, go for it. You know, you you get you got to put your own ego aside so that somebody else can flourish. I think, and uh, and anybody who can't do that, I don't think they're worth. Um, you know what? What good are they to you at that point? And 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 not to be selfish or sound, you know, selfish about it. But at you know, at now at this point that we're at, what can we achieve together? And that's really nothing. That, yeah. At that point. Yeah, and I think I, now it came to my mind one of the things that Steve Cohen said that was really mind blowing to me. There was a reason why we don't have one teacher across all classes when we go to school. Every year we get a brand new teacher because that teacher is focusing on a very specific curriculum and they will maximize our success in that period of time, but then they pass the baton to the next, to the next, to the next, and that really is what's raising our success. And I think, you know, in some way, I'm hoping that in some way we all can be one very friendly family and just hang out around, do some jujitsu, and nobody's pissed at anybody. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you got to get over it. It's a sore topic. It's a sore topic. I'm going to bring it up later. <laughs> I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. Um, listen, Marcus, we, we talked about a lot of recent stuff. We talked about a lot of, um, you know, your black belt, all the achievements that you've done. Pa, how in the world did all this start? When was the first time you stepped... Do you remember your first day? I ask this question almost every <laughs> single episode. Do you remember your very first day on the mat? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, a big smile. So, That's a good story with this, I assume. I've, yeah, I've got, I've got some decent stories. It's like it's pretty uh, like movie-esque, okay? So, growing up, I was very small. Very small. Like, I think my freshman year of high school, when they, like, they just picked me in the locker room one day. They are like, hey, how much do you weigh? I was like, I don't know, like 106 pounds. Like, hey, do you want a varsity or lighter? I was like, what do you need? Like, why don't you try this thing called wrestling? And they just picked me because they needed a warm body to go out and, and fill the roster, right? Mm-hmm. So I was small. Um, and when I was a sophomore in high school, I was dating a girl who was a junior. I felt so cool. And one day, <laughs> this kid who I grew up with in grade school, his name was Day Day. So I was 6'4", he's a linebacker. I kept hitting on him, right? Uh-oh. And I was like, you know, okay, what am I going to do? And the next day it happened again. And she looked at me one day and she's like, aren't you going to say something? <laughs> I was like, no. <laughs> uh, I guess I, got, I was like, oh, what am I going to Let me say something. So I was like, hey, man, you know, like, hey, Day Day, remember that time, you know, we all hung out at my house, you know, a bunch of years ago, we hang out on the bus. It's cool, yeah. Hey, you think you could not hit my girlfriend? And he grabbed me up by my jacket and put me up on the locker. I'm like out of a movie, I swear. Like my feet are kicking and like, you know, the rockers are rattling behind me. And I'm like, and she's standing there just watching this whole thing happen. And then he puts me down and hits me once. Like not that hard, but he hits me, right? Just to prove a point. I walks away. And I just remember being so mortified, so embarrassed. I was like, what, what the hell was I supposed to do? What was I going to do? So I, I went home and I was like Googling. I was like, how to develop one punch knockout power. That's it. That was what I, thought. I was like, this is how I'm going to win this That's fight. That's the know? solution. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a medicine ball over and over again at the wall and do push-ups, and I'm going to knock him out with one punch. And then, like, very quickly, I realized through the power of the internet that that wasn't going to happen. So I Googled Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because I found out that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was a grappling-based martial art, which was originally created with the intent of self-defense for a smaller and weaker individual to be able to effectively and efficiently defend themselves against a bigger, larger, stronger, more aggressive opponent. 
like my sales pitch. That was pretty beautiful. Good. Yeah, yeah you, didn't, you, wasn't you, even you memorized that. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I teach this to all our first day students when they come in for their intro. Right. Um, I digress, but I went and I tried jujitsu, and I'll never forget. I got beat up by a girl. Uh-huh. First day, they let me yep. spar. First day, and I got beat up by a girl. She like put me in clothes guard, and I like I didn't like slam her hard, but I didn't know what to do, so I kind of like picked her up a little bit, and, like put her down like semi aggressively, and she armbarred me, and then she triangled me, and I was like, "What the heck is going on? <laughs> this sucks." And I remind you, remind you, I'm a small kid, right? The woman was bigger than me, a grown woman, but I was like a, you know, hundred and nine or hundred and ten pound prepubescent going through puberty sophomore in high school and i was hooked i was like if this chick can beat me up i can definitely beat up data like, <laughs> and then like literally like like three weeks later i broke up with that girl that i was dating with or like we broke up whatever but i was hooked i was hooked i also liked it because i sucked at wrestling but like all the kids that were good at wrestling i was like yeah but uh, i could triangle you you know, like you're gonna try to pin me, it doesn't matter. I'm I'm gonna choke you unconscious. So that was how I started in jujitsu. So how did that evolution took place following months, following weeks, following weeks, following months as the years went on? Are you getting more hooked? Are you actually like are you looking at this as self defense or at which point did this convert into this art competition, more competitive, you know, obviously you're full-time life kind of that's later on um, as part of, as a chapter of your life. But at which point this converts from the self, I'm going to protect myself to, to the martial art, to the, to the competition aspect. Sure. So I definitely switched fairly, fairly, fairly early um, into a, sorry, I'm just on a call. So, um, I fairly switched uh, fairly early from the self-defense more to the sports side because I also wrestled in high school and I was like, Oh, like, this is cool. This is kind of like wrestling. It's grappling. It keeps me in shape. It's fun. Right. And I was like, ah, also I, I like those. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm badass. I can, I can choke you out. You know, like, <laughs> like I was small. Right. And I was like, and I'm Asian. So people picked on me. So I was like, you know what? Like, Oh yeah, I do know martial arts. Watch it. You know, um, sort of deal. Um, and then when I went to college, I just remember, I met the Lennon bros, um, Zach Lennon particularly was running the gym at the time. And I was in college and I went to school in the university of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri. And I knew zero people. I'm from New Jersey. I went out there strictly because I got a scholarship and I was like, well, what am I going to do with my life now? I don't have any friends out here. I don't drink alcohol because I was underage and i never really did that. Like as a kid much, I didn't really party. I, mean, I did here and there, but not really. I guess I should just do this jujitsu thing and like have at it. And these are the first set of people who like I had a had a bond with and a friendship with in this new environment. And I think that right there was a very significant part about it. In that I was out in the middle of nowhere and I found a group of people who were primarily older than me who knew the area and like kind of looked out for me. Right. And like took care of me when, you know, I was a young man, but like still very much mentally a child. Um, and beyond that, um, I got a really cool opportunity when I was a blue belt. Um, there was a company, uh, they're still around today, uh, 40 Thieves Clothing, right? And the owner of the company really took a, a gamble on me and helped me out with a sponsorship and gave me some free gear. And I went out to California for the world championships as a blue belt. Um, on my 20th birthday, I, I competed at the blue belt level. I believe this was 2013. Uh, and the owner of the company had a spare room in his house uh, in Costa Mesa and put me up and showed me around California. And I didn't win the tournament by any means. I actually won four matches by submission. And then I lost the fifth to the guy who got second in the quarterfinals. So I was like one off from getting a medal. Um, but I just remember this experience was so cool to me. Like here I am in California. I've never been here before. This man is like hooking me up giving me free stuff, like showing me around California, like paying for my food. He took me surfing. I went to an aquarium. Like it was such a cool experience. I was like, man, like you're telling me that people can do this like, full time. Like this is all people do. Like, this is how they live. They just get to like roll around on the mat and like teach you to all day. Like this is, this is a dream. Like, I want to do that. 
So what was this? Was, was this where the seed was planted for you to do jujitsu as a as a as a profession as a as a for for a living? Yes, one hundred percent. I just remember being there, and I was like, man, this was such a cool, great experience. I want to be able to do this all the time. And that that experience of being at the World Championships and seeing these really really high level guys, I believe that was the year that Barley Ostima hit like the crazy spider guard knee bar. We stepped from the outside and spun around and knee barred the guy like really really epically. And like I'm also like completely obsessed with that move. So if any of my com competition ever watches this interview, they're gonna know like one of my favorite moves. <laughs> I probably should have said that, right? Um, we we, we but, talked to yeah, Bradley just a few episodes ago. So <laughs> yeah, really, that's, that's super cool. He's he, he's he's a trip, man. He's yeah, he's, yeah. A, he's, he's a lot so of fun. Energy. Yeah, yeah, a lot of energy. It's yeah. This is definitely something that planted a seed and and really sparked my interest. And I definitely took time off when I turned like 21 and I started hanging out. You know, like while I was out there. But I just remember like that was like the the fondest memory I could say of something that made me like really, really excited and happy prior to like my mind getting kind of diluted with like societal expectation or like, oh, yeah, like you should go to the bar and hang out with the college kid, you know. I do want to talk about your time off for in a moment, but first I want to ask you this. Mm -hmm. It appears to me as an outsider listening to your story that you have like these chapters in your life and the one, mm -hmm. the first one. You, you know, it appears to me as, um, you know, not, not as outgoing person. Um, perhaps there was not a lot of um, friendships or relationships. You, you move around a little bit due to college and other things. And this jujitsu thing, and, and you being bullied even, right? And, 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 and pushed around perhaps, you know, whatever terminology you want to use. And this jujitsu thing literally flips the personality in a sense. At least that's how I'm sensing this. To, to the point where you become more confident. Two, um, you definitely create relationships. Three, it, it changes the way, the trajectory of your life, in a sense, from what you want out of the life. A am, I, am, I, am I on the right path here, like listening to your story? Yeah, 110%. I would say that prior to me doing jiu-jitsu, I wouldn't say that I was a loner by any means. I had, some, I had friends, for sure, but I wasn't really that outgoing. I wasn't that confident and I didn't have much direction. Right? I didn't really know what I want to do. I like to like play video games and hang out, right? Like do regular kid stuff. But like, if you asked me really like what I wanted to do, I'd be like, I don't, I don't know. What am I supposed to do? You know? And when I found Jiu Jitsu, I was like, yeah, this is something I'd like to do. Um, originally when I went to college, I, I wanted to, to study nutrition and fitness. And this was only because this was the closest thing you could study doing like jujitsu or grappling or fighting like in a college degree right like would be like athletic training kinesiology or nutrition fitness and like the nutrition side of it like sounded like a little more like oh you can get a job doing this that might help people for real so let's do that but like really i just want to do jujitsu i don't know I like, who, oh, this might help with my jujitsu so let me let me study this i don't know who told us on the on the on the, on the show but he's they said the moment you start organizing your entire life around jiu-jitsu you know you're you hooked you're yeah. addicted like there's there was no going back <laughs> yeah. yeah so i've been hooked for like 10 years then because i was like at 18 <laughs> well good for you good for you i wish more people were hooked and i think more people i wish more people would take advantage of the benefits that jiu-jitsu is really drawing and i'm not talking about the mad the skill i'm, I'm talking about the life skills that we can really develop the relationships the um, the, the, the continuous troubleshooting, you know, the management of situation and anxiety and, and, and so on. There were so many, so many, um, you know, perks of doing this. Yeah. Well, I want to know, Thomas brought up chapters. Um, do you know what the next one is? Are you, are you letting it just unfold or do you have, you know, you said you don't write things down, uh, you don't clear cut goals, but do you know what the next chapter is going to be? What the, what the, uh, outcome you're looking for is? Let me clarify too. I do have uh, I do have clear cut goals. And I do write things down. Uh, <laughs> just it's never uh, tournament related. Okay. All right. right. Wonderful. I feel like that. that helps. I have, I can uh, become like anxious. I'm a fairly anxious person. Sure. I believe this has helped me become uh, fairly successful at the things I do because I obsess over small details. But I think when I compete, right, that sort of anxiety like works against me. So I I purposely don't do that. Um, in regards to the next chapter, you know, I'm really excited for the current chapter which I guess is the next chapter, right? I don't really look too far into the future because I'm really excited for the current chapter. Um, the current chapter, you know, is like, I just got my black belt. Uh, I'm working and training here at a central jiu-jitsu in White Plains, New York. 
really great gym started by really great people i'm really excited to grow this academy uh from uh, a jujitsu standpoint as well as a professional standpoint i'm really excited to help uh professor jt and his wife yolanda grow their affiliation right and make everything really really uh well organized both from a business and jujitsu standpoint and really uh, blossom in that regard um someone recently asked me where do i see myself in five or ten years which is like kind of along the same lines of what i feel like you've asked um i could definitely see myself still being here or i could see myself running an academy i don't know if i really want to own my own gym just because i know how much work it really is like i really <laughs> understand my father's a small business owner uh, i worked in my father's car shop from 12 until basically 27 uh some way for shape or form barring when i was in missouri and even when i would come home for the holidays i would work for him you know so i understand the responsibility and the dedication and the stress which is involved with owning a business especially a jiu-jitsu gym and i feel like if i really owned my own gym there's a chance it would take from my love it would make it too much of a job so wait a will minute. i own it wait, wait a minute. Are, are you are you saying that jiu-jitsu instructors don't just show up for one hour <laughs> teach one class go home and go on the beach and surf what, what let, let me clarify this what, what for the say, entire world. What are you world. saying? <laughs> let me explain this to the whole world because there is a very common misconception. No kidding. Just, <laughs> should just not only do, okay. Not only is there a misconception that that's what jujitsu instructors do, there is a misconception in young jujitsu professionals that that's what they should try to do, and this is the oh. farthest thing from the truth. This is the most, most haphazard, for lack of better words, half-assed approach to it. Because for every one hour you spend on the mat teaching, in my personal opinion, and then again, I'm just some guy. What do I know, right? You need to be spending at least two to three hours off the mat studying or thinking about jujitsu. And this is just from a teaching standpoint and a training standpoint. If you're also the business owner, it's closer to four or five hours off. Now, there are exceptions to this rule. If you are a very, very high level competitor, chances are you need to have someone else who can do the business aspect of the gym for at least while you're in serious competitive preparation. And this is very, very important, I feel, right? It is very, very difficult for a high level jujitsu athlete, especially in the modern day, to successfully run a business on their own and prepare for high level competition. I'm not going to say it's impossible. This is very, very difficult. There are many, many aspects of a jiu-jitsu gym that people are completely oblivious to. I think one of the most common ones, right, is overhead cost and labor. People say, oh, all you have to do is show up and teach. No, you have to clean the mat. You have to open the facility. You have to make sure the locker room is clean. You have to make sure the fridge has water. In it. You have to make sure, I don't know, you have Band-Aids, tape, a radio, so on and so forth. Oh, how many geese do we have in stock? Are we going to run out of geese? Are we going to run out of rash guards? Do we have the belts to promote someone when we need to promote someone? And these are all things that no one pays attention to, right? Because most people show up to the gym and they just train. They don't have to worry about it. But if people want to aspire to be successful in jujitsu from a business standpoint, most of the money you're going to make is not from the actual jujitsu itself. It's everything surrounding it. I am really happy you said that. <laughs> I'm really happy you said that. First of all, I I I I want to deviate for a second. I want to give Ray shout out here. Yeah, Ray Ray is my our GM, um, and he does phenomenal job. I, he goes through so much hell with me, so I I do appreciate all his work. Yeah, I think that's a, one <laughs> of the Let's hardest. Not talk. Let's not even talk about dealing with memberships and people. Yeah, that's what I, I, we did it. Yeah. Listen, everything yeah. you mentioned, I feel like is less than half of operationally mm -hmm. what is happening. You know, yeah. we're not talking about just, the, you know, just managing the phone yeah. calls, the yeah, the leads, I, I, the nonsense, and the you know the <laughs> stuff that you have to do for the, for all that. Ray deserves um, well, a both lot of, of you, credit. Marcus. Same thing for yeah. you. I mean, it it, it, it is. I, I'm really is you know. I'll tell you in all seriousness, jokes aside, it is very refreshing to talk to somebody who not only takes a lot of pride in running a jujitsu academy, but also drives to be efficient, find a success in it, and really treats it professionally, not as a club, but as a business. So my head go, goes off to you, and, and uh, you, you, you and your team and JT obviously have been doing a phenomenal job you know, in public eye. So g good for you. I mean, good for so you. I, phenomenal. I, I must say, you know, uh, I don't do this alone, right? Although I am the general manager, uh, 
uh, GT's wife, Yolanda. Yeah. She was doing all of this before I got over here. And then um, it was just very, very uh, clear to me that there was an opportunity for someone who was driven and motivated to work and wanted to work to help her. And I have no idea how she did all of this on her own before I got around here. Like, it's like, even now, like, we're both always like swamped and busy. And like, before I get here, she was doing this all by herself. So like, you can say hats off to me, but really like hats off to her because she is like me tenfold. Yeah. Right? Well, um, if, you, if whoever's listening out there, I, I want you to take a moment and, and, and really go to your academy and give whoever's running that facility, give a pat on the back. Because I think as much as instructor does a lot of work, or instructors, they do a lot of work off the mat. I think the GM or the staff in the front office, they do a lot of work that is not being seen. You guys, you guys are the pain cushion. You, you guys are the one who hear all the people complain and have have the good days, the bad days. You, it, it's insane the, the 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 how important that function is in every every academy and often underestimated. Often underestimated. That's it. No more compliments for you. <laughs> We're done with compliments. We've for done Ray? Compli- for, yeah, we, Ray won't we, get another one we, for a few months. We, so. we, 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 yeah. Uh, we've been at this for an hour, but before we start wrapping this up, I do want to talk about the break that you talk. Um, you, you, you mentioned a couple times during this conversation. How long was it? Um, I would say for roughly two and a half to three years, I didn't, I didn't train. Maybe in that time period, I trained four or five times. Define, um, define your engage. And I'm going somewhere with this. I think mm-hmm. taking a break in jiu-jitsu, for whatever reason it is, injuries, mm-hmm. being lazy, life-changing, whatever, the break is very hard part because it's a life-changing event, right? Um, mm-hmm. For three years, define what's happening in your life. You're going from training to no training? Are you engaged in jiu-jitsu in any shape or form? Are you watching videos? Are you still following? Are you a fan? Or this is completely unplugged and Marcus is gone? I would say that I was always definitely still plugged in in regards to ingesting jiu-jitsu media, keeping up with who was winning, things of that nature, not really watching so much technique videos. Right. So I basically, I would say from 2000, 2014 to 2016, I didn't train very much. Um, and the real reason for this, for, for lack of any other explanation, was that I turned 21 years old and I started hanging out and partying. Like, no, no, no other excuse, right? I, I just turned 21 and I was in college. And also I started bartending and hanging out at the bar. And when you get off work at the bar, the only other people who are off work are restaurant and bar people. And all they want to do is drink and party. And throughout this, I definitely lost my sense of identity uh, to myself, right? And changed as a person a lot. Um, I would not, I don't regret any of it at all. I would never do it again, but I don't regret any of it all because it really taught me who I was today. In fact, if I didn't go through this phase, I may have graduated college on time and just gotten like a regular job and never pursued jujitsu as a career. So I truly believe that this was, was not maybe meant to be, a positive thing with like how, how I, I, I used it to turn it around. Like there's a silver lining. In this. Um, it was definitely very hard. I didn't train. And then I remember coming back being, I remember one of the biggest motivating factors for me was when I came back to jiu-jitsu, I saw these other guys who were like brown belts and I was a purple belt. And I was like, man, this guy's a brown belt now. Like you should beat him up. Like how is he a higher belt? Than like what? Like I trained with people who I should beat, and I was like just exhausted. And maybe I still won, but I was dead beat exhausted. Um, yeah. Sorry, what was what was the question? I got off topic. I feel. Yeah. No. 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 You. You. You're right, you're right on, on it. it, yeah. it, it so, what what encourages you to come back? Because as much as so priorities, mm-hmm. essentially, you say priorities in my life changed. Good, bad doesn't matter. Priorities have changed, and the the space that jujitsu was filling in your life now, bartending, partying social aspect filled that ga- fill that space in that's essentially what happens this this is life this is what happens with our lives right but going back to jujitsu now that is the hard part that's where a yeah. lot of people 
struggle. Oh, I, I miss jujitsu. I miss training with you guys. But I just, I, just, I don't know. I, I just, I have this and this and this. This happens all the time, all the time. What in the world got your mind to switch back and go back into what you really love? Because I feel like a lot of people want to do it, but they don't know how. Yes, okay. So for me, what had happened was, so yes, I was partying and bartending all this. And a big part of it too uh, was, was women. Like, you know, young guy, <laughs> college town, the covered truth, in tattoos. The truth knows is how to coming fight, out. Has a six pack, right? So like, yeah, mayhem. Right? But I remember I had like a moment of clarity. And like Gary, has, moment. Gary has six pack. I knew it's in my fridge. <laughs> yeah. That's the best type. Yep, That's the absolutely. best type. Right there. It's always there. Who wants, a, who wants a six pack when you can have a K? Let's be honest. <laughs> I, I can't, now I feel okay. bad. So, yeah, so, sorry, I, sorry, I, man. I, yeah. I, I, go ahead. A quarter go barrel, maybe. <laughs> <the whole cake. laughs> oh, go on, Mark. I kind of had like a sobering moment and I moved back to New Jersey and. I just was like, okay, like when was I happy before the the party, drinking and hanging out, the bar, and I enjoyed bartending. I would say that I filled the void of my like nerdiness. Like as much, like, I'm a jiu-jitsu nerd. Like I study jiu-jitsu. I want to be good at it, right? I filled that void with bartending. Like I got very into like classical cocktails and learning about different intricacies about liquors and how to make a drink, right? Um, so I applied like the same like drive I had into into the bar. Um, but I just remember getting back to my parents' house and sitting around and working for my dad in the car shop. And uh, I was thinking, maybe I'll take over my dad's business, this, this, and this. I was working like 60 hours a week. And I just wasn't happy. And I was like, what, what made you happy? Like, when were you really happy? And it was when I was doing jujitsu. Mm-hmm. So I was like, man, I, I need to get back to doing jujitsu. So I started doing jujitsu again. And very, like within like three months of me training at a local gym in New Jersey, I was one of the, I wasn't the best guy in the room, but I was in the top 25%. And within four or five months, I was in like the top 15% of the guys in the room. And all the guys who were beating me were like significantly bigger and stronger. Like there was no one around my size and skill, really. I said maybe the owner of the gym and he was still a little bigger than me and older than me and he was a black belt already. And that's when I was like, okay. Uh-oh. There we go. <laughs> the operations begin. <laughs> uh, those, so that first, that first couple months back before you got into the groove, were you ever discouraged? Or was it like, you know, you knew there was a light at the end of the tunnel? Or were you discouraged at all? I was a little discouraged, but I knew that I thought about all the stupid things I was doing in my time off. I was just like, well, if you were doing this well after doing all that dumb stuff, imagine what happened if you didn't do that. So if you just apply yourself harder now, you can maybe not make up for the lost time, but you'll get a little bit closer. Yeah. Nice. And that was kind of just what I put in my mind. Yeah. And I, and I think the main message here is they're coming back until uh, after any type of break it doesn't matter whether it's injury or priorities whatever it is it is hard it is difficult to come back but i think the reward and the fruit that we can collect when we come back is significantly greater if we didn't and and that's something that i, I want you guys whoever's listening to this keep that in mind i i see it so often there is a passion for jujitsu life takes unexpected turns we take a break and we never return, not because we don't want to, it's because we are scared, we are, con- we, we are concerned, we, we, we don't want to take the risk. We don't want to go back because we are concerned about what's going to happen if these guys are better, I am not good enough, I took a break, I have to start over. It's all overthinking it. Just get back, get, pack that bag, go to the academy, step on the mat and be done. You love it. You know you do. I, I agree with you. If I, if I could say something as well, please For all the people who are like, Oh, I want to get back in the gym, but Oh, I have to get back in shape first. Or, Oh, I have to take care of this first, man. Just get on the mat. Even if you don't spar the first day, just get on the mat. I promise you, you are going to feel better about yourself. You're going to feel happier. Mm-hmm. You're going to feel purpose. You're going to feel motivated and driven. Even if you get the piss knocked out of you and a cross face 
and tap like a million times and you're <laughs> sitting on the side of the mat and you feel like your heart's going to come out of your chest mm-hmm. and like you're going to throw up i promise you you're going to feel better after you just get back on the mat all you need to do is break that ice yeah and then it's all going to be easier but if you keep putting it off who knows how long it's going to be and look what happened with the pandemic for everyone that did jujitsu we all love jujitsu so much and for so many people not even people like me who do jujitsu for a living for people who have a real job, like a real regular nine to five job and have kids and stressors at home and maybe some issues with their relationship, whatever it might be. Jiu-Jitsu is where you go and you don't think about those things. It's like a meditation because if you're thinking about that other stuff when you're Jiu-Jitsu, mm-hmm. you're going to lose and you're going to get beat up. Yep. So you have to like be present and it takes you away from those other things and it lets you release and relax. Right. And it was all taken from us. So if you keep putting that day off, it might not come. So just get back on the mat yourself i love it i love it i want to finish this on a strong note because i think this is a strong message um that you just mentioned um but before we finish this amazing conversation end of every episode we we do this cool thing where whoever was sitting in your seat in the previous episode did ask a question not knowing who's going to be answering it um so we do have a question for you Mm-hmm. And Gary's going to take a lead on this, and I think this is going to be a good one. Yeah, this is from Rory Singer, um, and he wants to know, what would you tell an athlete who came to you and said they wanted to be a world champion? <laughs> <laughs> I knew that would get you thinking. Yeah, oh, yeah this is good. <laughs> because I'm not a world champion, but I've been around a lot of them. Mm-hmm. I would tell them, first off, First off, I would ask them, have you ever been around a world champion? And then that would be a very important question for them to answer. And then I would tell them that they have to get ready for, especially, especially if we're talking about in jiu-jitsu, you better be ready to work very, very hard for a very long time and make very, very little money and suffer. Like, I know it sounds pretty negative the way I'm saying this, but you have to be ready to suffer a lot. You have to be ready to be put in a lot of pain and a lot of sacrifice to get what you want. And if you are okay with that, and this is really what you want, the world is yours. But just know, just when you think that you've suffered enough, you you haven't done it. And I'm not a world champion, but I know. You have to be obsessed with the success. You don't have to like the work, but you have to be obsessed with the result. And the result is the championship. Uh, I I read a not a lot, but I read a decent amount of like sports psych books and I don't really like the self-help books, but one I really do like is Relentless by Tim Grover. And I don't know if you guys have ever read that book or anyone who's watching the show has read the book, but Tim Grover was uh, Michael Jordan's uh, strength and conditioning coach Coach. for his entire career. And he's also worked with Wayne Wade and Kobe, right? Um, It's a very unapologetic book, a very intense book. And People who know me know I'm a pretty intense person, right? Um, and he says, you, you don't have to like doing the work, but the result is so damn good. So that's what I would tell. tell them. Beautiful. Wow. Great answer. I don't, I don't even have a response to that. Dude. You, you just nailed it right there. What a beautiful answer. What a beautiful conversation. Um, what a beautiful journey. Once again, I do want to congratulate you on your recent black belt. What an achievement. Be proud of it. I know it's slowly sinking in and the new goals are getting <laughs> put on the paper and so on and you're planning your life and, 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 and you know, I'll be I'll be sitting sitting back and watching as 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 you continue competing and running the facility and doing amazing things in your life. If anybody would like to reach out to you and connect with you, um, where where can they find you? Social media, yeah. websites, mm-hmm. where are you available? And then obviously talk a little bit about the Academy um, um, with JT. Yeah, sure. So if anyone wanted to connect with me, um, they can find me on Instagram, MRJ underscore CGQ. I also run a side business in addition to uh, teaching and training and working here at Essential. It's called Tatami to Go. You can also find us on Instagram in which I bring mats to people's houses and teach private lessons and small group lessons there. I uh, invented this or founded this company during the pandemic when the government mandated that all the gyms were closed. And I saw this opportunity that people still wanted to do jiu-jitsu. So I was driving around Manhattan with mats in the back of my little Honda Civic and like pulling them out in Central Park and climbing up staircases uh, with, with rollout mats. But yeah, you can find me there. Uh, you can also email me, my name, M-A-R-C-U-S, 
Marcus at essentialbjj.com, and I'll be more than happy to email anyone back. Um, in regards to the academy, right? We're here at Essential Jiu Jitsu. I'm here right now. Uh, I'm here all the time. I'm not scheduled. I'm not here. I'm not scheduled seven days a week, but I'm here pretty much seven days a week. Um, <laughs> I invite anyone to come by and get some training with us. We have a really great environment. We have a beautiful new facility, two mat spaces, three individual glass door, like sauna style showers. It's gorgeous here. I've never seen such a nice academy in my life. And it's not just because I work here. I, I really stand by it. If anyone has the opportunity to come over here, I promise you, you'll not be let down by the facility we have here. Uh, we're at 10 County Center Road in White Plains, New York. Um, Professor JT is here. Um, he's on the mats nearly every day. You know, one of the coolest things about jujitsu, right, is if you like basketball, can you go play a, a pickup game with Dwayne Wade or Kobe or LeBron or Michael? No. In jujitsu, you might be able to roll with your legends one day. And all you got to do is pop up at their gym on the day that they teach. And in this case, JT teaches a lot, you know, so I, I highly encourage people to come visit, you know, love to have some people come by. Beautiful. Well, if you're in the area, make sure you go check out um, and, and uh, talk to Marcus. Seems like uh, it could be a good, good trip to, to get beat up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's always a good one. No, it's, it's always, always a, good a good time. Listen, before you get it, you had something? No, I just want to say congratulations like Thomas did on, on, on getting that black belt recently. Um, and thank you so much for doing this. And I, I really love your enthusiasm for everything that, that we've talked about today. So thank you for that. Yeah, we do appreciate the conversation. We do appreciate the stories. And um, we'll, be, we'll, we'll see you on the mat. Beautiful. Peace. Thank you. Later. Thank you for listening to Raw Radio. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review and help us make the show even more amazing. For future episodes, check out our website and follow us on all major podcast platforms. Take care.